Good morning. My name is Tyler Smith. I serve in our gospel communities as a GC co-leader, and I'm on staff as one of our assistants. Today, we're going to be reading from 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there, and if you don't have one, there should be one in the seat in front of you that you can use. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mysteries of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well, For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tyler. Church family, good to see you this Sunday. Hope you are well. Uh, As always, if you are new here at Northway, if you're a guest among us, I welcome you. My name is Shay Sumlin, one of the pastors here. Grateful you're with us. Who is ready for an exhilarating message on church administration and deaconing today? I know that's, you're, you're ready. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, I, I really am excited about this text. We are in 1 Timothy, one of the letters in our New Testament, and we're looking at God's design for the church. The beautiful thing about God is he has not left us aimless here as to what the church is, what our purpose is, and even how we're to be organized in such a way in our assembly that we Uh, would see flourishing happening within the church where members are taken care of and the mission of God is moving forward and bodies being equipped to go proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And um, what we've been looking at recently are what are the two, kind of the twofold design of leadership offices that God has set forth for his church. We looked at one of them a couple of weeks ago, the, the office of elder um, and essentially these, these qualified men who are, um, whose role is to exist, they, they exist, the elder does, to serve the church by leading. This week, we're gonna look at a second office of deacon who exists to lead in the church by serving. And so these two are very complementary that God has designed so that the, they would work together in such a way that the needs of the church would be cared for and the preaching ministry of the church and the mobilization of the church can go forward and flourish. Now, here's the deal. Whenever a church grows, challenges always arise. So whenever a church, whether you're moving from five people to 50, whether it's 50 to 5,000, there are certain ceilings of complexity that evolve as a church grows. And if you're not careful in those transitions of growth, needs within the church can get neglected, can even get abdicated. Now, all of us would probably testify to that. If you've been around the church for any period of time, and especially if you've been at Northway for any period of time, we can identify there are gonna be balls that are dropped at times as we move from one ceiling to the next in our growth. Uh, Certainly, there's been times when you've emailed and didn't get a response back or that you signed up for something and didn't hear back, or you came to the church and didn't get greeted in a way that you were hoping to, or or maybe within the church you had certain needs that arose that just you felt like were neglected and ministries that could be and just didn't get addressed. Whatever it may be, all of us, if we spend any time at any church, and especially here, you're gonna experience some of those gaps. And and that's part of our human nature. in our, in, in, in not only within us, but even within the structures that we try to steward. But thankfully, in God's infinite mind, he foresaw this. He, he knew that this was gonna be an issue. And so part of his design in the church was creating a complementary role to the elders that would help in serving some of those needs that arise from time to time within the church so that those needs don't get neglected. What I wanna do today is I wanna show you when it comes to the role of a deacon in a church, I wanna show you its origin, where it came from, how it evolved. I wanna show you its office, how it grew into the formality that it is. And I wanna show you its occupation, what it is and who it is that's supposed to be fulfilling this role 
of deacon in the church. Now, to begin with, I wanna go to its origin. So I need you to hold your place in 1 Timothy 3. We're gonna come back there. Flip over, if you would, with me to Acts chapter six. Acts chapter six there in the New Testament. It gives us a little bit of the seedbed of how this role of a deacon came to be. And uh, I mentioned with growth comes complexities and neglects. And that's exactly what you see in the early church. Lest you think that the early church was some pristine thing that if only we could get back to it, then all of our ills would be solved. Oh no, from the beginning, the church had its struggles. By the time we get to Acts chapter six, we've seen the church grow from 120 people in an upper room to 3,000 people when Peter preaches his first sermon who gets saved. Two chapters later, the church has grown to 5,000 people. By the time we get to Acts chapter six, it is estimated we're around 8,000 Christians that are now in Jerusalem. This is a mega church very quickly. And with this growth comes challenges and needs that are unmet. Here's one of them. Acts chapter six, verse one. I just wanna move through this quickly um, and just show you the origin of this. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So again, growth brings problems. And one of the things we see here in this church as it is growing is you've got an issue of bigotry that is leading to an abdication of care. Now, what had happened prior to this, the book of Acts begins um, right after, um, right after uh, the Passover when Jesus was crucified. He was then resurrected three days later. 40 days after that, he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And now what you have is Pentecost. Now for Passover and Pentecost, these two big feasts in Israel, people from, this is one of the mandatory pilgrimage feasts. So you have, you have Jewish people from all over the Roman empire coming back to Jerusalem in this time. And while they're there, they hear Peter's sermon. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. A Jew is not converted. They are completed. They rest in their savior, Jesus Christ. And now all of a sudden the church is getting built up But remember, this church is consisting of native Hebrews who live there in Jerusalem, who are used to going to the temple, practicing the sacrifices, obeying the letter of the law. And you also have all these Greek-influenced Jews who in the diaspora, when persecution hit and they were scattered and they just lived in Rome and they lived over in modern-day Turkey now and lived in all these places, when they came back, These were called Hellenist Jews. Like think Helen of Troy. They were Greek influenced Jews. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have the sacrifices. So they learned to spiritualize a lot of their faith. And so the native Jews tend to call those liberals and those tend to call the native Jews conservatives. And now they're all together. They've all been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you have Republicans and Democrats in the same Sunday school. What are you gonna do? All kinds of tensions developing here. And one of them is bigotry. The native Hebrews saying, I, I, I got a lot of question about these Greek influenced Jews. And so we're gonna pass over their widows. The most vulnerable of the population in that day were orphans and widows. And the widows were being neglected. They had no family to take care of them. These are true widows, no family to take care of them. It's the church who's gonna step in and care. And yet there was a particular group that was being overlooked because of bigotry. Now, here's the deal. That issue is the root issue. Bigotry, that's gonna get dealt with in Acts chapter 13 when, and it's gonna come through the preaching of the word and an understanding of the nature of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to tear down walls and build a new humanity where there's not Jew and Gentile or Greek and Hebrew. There's just one body in Christ. That'll get solved a little later, but right now, we've got an issue of neglect of widows. And so what happens here um, is this neglect creates another neglect in verse two. So the 12, that is the apostles, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, they summoned the full number of disciples and they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to go serve tables. 
That wasn't that they weren't servant-hearted, didn't want to care. It's they cared too much. God had assigned the 12 as apostles. They were, uh, this is kind of a prototype of what would come later on a localized level of elders, but these apostles had their primary job given by God, which was to minister the word of God, to teach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ according to his word and the ministry of prayer, as we'll see here in just a moment. And that's their post. That's what their function is. But they're getting pulled off that post to go help meet the needs, the tangible needs of these women who are being neglected. And it's a good thing they're doing it, but it's a bad thing that they're giving up their posts. And so now we got two issues going on here. And so what is the solution for this? How does the church, because if they're getting pulled off their post and the church is not uh, being nourished in the word and the church is beginning to drift, how do you solve this? Answer, verse three. We're gonna need to gather an army of faithful servants to delegate this work to. And in fact, if you look at verse two, that word, that phrase serve tables, that word serve in the Greek is the word diakoneo, which means we get the term deacon. It's just a word in Greek that means servant. That's what deacon means. Now, this is not an official office yet. These are just servants. These are um, appointed uh, servants to go take care of these needs. And, uh, and so we need some deacons here. We need some servant-hearted men in this situation who are willing to step into the gap and care for these physical needs that have been abdicated. But it can't just be any servants. They need to be qualified servants. You see that in verse three. Therefore, pick from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we'll appoint to this duty. Two categories right there, good repute, full of spirit and wisdom. These are to be servants of high character and they've got to be fully devoted in their faith in Jesus Christ. They can't be partially motivated by the gospel. They got to be fully seared in it. Why do we need these servants like this? So in verse four, so the apostles can continue to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Notice the twofold priority of the apostles, of the leaders of the church, it is the ministry of the word, that is proclamation, and it is the ministry of prayer, that is the power of the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do to fulfill that word. And that's what the apostles were given to. So in verse five, they find these seven men from among the congregation who fit that quality of high character and fully devoted in faith. And they lay hands on them and they appoint them with the authority of the church to go take care of these needs. They got authority to go make decisions, to go figure out the best way to care for these widows that are being neglected. In verse seven, notice the result. When the apostles are now freed up so they can focus on what God has appointed them to do, and these deacons or these servants here are raised up so that they could go serve in the way that God has appointed them to serve. The result in verse seven is that the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests even became obedient to the faith. That's when you know you're cooking is when the priests get saved. We're praying for those priests right now. They get saved here. But here's what happens. Now the elders can be freed up to preach the word to be given in prayer and minister the nourishment of the word of God and the gospel to the church. And the deacons can go meet and care for the needs that are, that are practical here and the church flourishes. That is God's beautiful design. Now, this is not formal yet. This is just the seedbed. You can't, this is descriptive more than it necessarily is prescriptive. We're gonna get more prescriptive later. So here's what happens. Now we move from the origin to how did this become an office? Fast forward the tape 25 years after Acts chapter six. The apostle Paul has come to faith. He is now writing two thirds of your quiet times out of your New Testament. He has writ written a letter to the church that is in Philippi in Northern Greece. And he's writing them and he's instructing them. And I want you to hear how he begins the letter in verse one of Philippians. Listen to this, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. it'll be on the screen. Paul and Timothy, these are the two cats that we're dealing with in 1 Timothy, right here behind the letter of, of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, that local church there, 
with, and listen what he mentions, with the episcopoi and the diaconoi, with the overseers, that's the pastors, and the diaconoi, the deacons, the ministers. 25 years after the events of Acts chapter 6, this is now morphed in to two offices that exist in the leadership of the church, elders and deacons, and we need them both. So these offices are in play here. And now by the time Paul appoints Timothy, his sidekick, to go serve as the pastor in Ephesus, um, he writes a letter a few years after Philippians in 1 Timothy to instruct Timothy on the qualifications for these two offices and who should occupy them. So we move from the origin to the office, and now I want you to see the occupation. Turn back with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy 3, and we'll see what this office, who it exists for. What you're gonna find here on the heels of the qualifications we went through at the beginning of chapter three for elders you're gonna see a dang near identical qualification list for the deacons with two exceptions that we'll talk about in a minute. But most of this is the same. These are character qualifications. What Paul is after, more than talent, more than skill, more than good looks, more than anything else, is after character. If you can't trust the person, then you can't trust the ministry. And so seven qualifications are given for a deacon. I'm gonna go through them quickly because they mirror most of what we went through with the elders. Notice in verse eight of chapter three, in 1 Timothy, Paul includes an umbrella qualification, much like he did with the elders. Elders, the first thing was they had to be above reproach. That's a summary of all the other qualifications that are gonna follow. In the same way for deacons, they get one too. They're to be dignified. Like elders, they are to be worthy of respect because of their high manner of honorable conduct. They are to be exemplary members. All an elder and a deacon is in their character is they're exemplifying what every member in the body of Christ should look like. Now, that being said, under that umbrella term, now come the next six uh, characteristics here, qualifications. And I want you to notice the first three are in the negative what must not be with a deacon, and the second three are in the positive, what must be with a deacon. When you look at the three negatives right out of the gate, all of them are attached to one fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And you see this. First out, they're not to be double-tongued. That's that idea we saw with the elders. You're not to be in one room saying one thing and then go to another room in the church and say something totally different thereby creating division in the church. You're not to be double-tongued or two-faced or two-tongued in this one. And this is key because think about the temptation of a deacon. A deacon is in the mortar of the church. They are the hands and feet, the servants, ministering to practical needs of the members, helping to organize and administrate the various ministries of the church that are executing the vision of the elders as according to the word of God. When you're on the front lines of meeting with members' needs, you are gonna be totally exposed to the members' complaints. And think about that. When you're serving, you're gonna have some sheep who are gonna bite back. They're frustrated. Some of them are hurt because needs have been neglected. They, they, they're experiencing gaps in the church. They feel lost. They feel unseen. They feel like I've got these huge needs and, and there's nobody to help me with them to carry this in the midst of that. And they're frustrated. They're frustrated at the church. How easy would it be as a deacon in that moment that you're ministering to somebody and they're just complaining about everything that's going on in the church and, and just to be a people pleaser in that moment and go, you know what? You're right. Those elders, I've been saying the same thing for the last 30 years and they just don't even listen to me. And then they go back to the elders room and go, you guys are killing it. Great job today. Everything's going well. A-okay. That would create division in a church. A, a, a deacon can't be a people pleaser in this moment. A deacon has to be for the preservation of unity in the church. In fact, that's the whole spirit of Acts chapter six. With that bigotry going on, part of their role was to meet needs so the church didn't split and fall apart. 
They've got to be folks who go in there and see the church built up. And, and they're going to be pro kingdom of God in the church, even amidst some of the challenges that we're facing. They're going to be honest about it. But they're not going to split the church through their tongue. In fact, it's been said that when it comes to this nature of double tongued, there's two sides to this. One is flattery. One is the sin of flattery. The other is the sin of gossip and slander. Flattery is when you're willing to say something to someone's face that you wouldn't otherwise say behind their back. Gossip and slander is when you are willing to say something behind somebody's back that you wouldn't say to their face. It's two sides of the same coin. And a deacon cannot be that. In addition, they're not to be addicted to much wine there in verse eight. It's the same idea with elders of being drunkards. Um, A deacon must not be enslaved to addictive substances that would otherwise impair their judgment and hinder their work or witness. You gotta be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's who's guiding you, not these alternative exterior substances that now cloud your judgment and and impair your witness. You, You need to be free to follow the Holy Spirit. In addition to that, they're not to be greedy for dishonest gain there in verse eight. Again, same with elders. Uh, And this is at the backdrop of the false teachers who we're gonna find out later in this this, uh, book who were doing what they were doing for dishonest gain. They wanted to earn, they wanted to fleece the sheep for money. Now I know that's hard to believe in our day and age that there would be church scandals and pastors and deacons out there who are actually hijacking the church um, behind the scenes with money fraud. I know it's hard to believe that but that happened here. And no, it certainly happens in our day. And that is why nor an elder nor a deacon are to be greedy for dishonest gain. We're not here for the money. We're not here to try to get rich off the church. We're here to serve the church in the image of Christ sacrificially, not to operate out of impure motives of self-gain and greed. And so those are the three negatives. Now watch the three positives. Here's what a deacon must have. They are to, in verse nine, hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Mystery of the faith, that is a Pauline term that Paul uses in many of his letters in the New Testament. A mystery is something that's re- that was previously hidden and now has been revealed. In this context, as Paul uses it, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's God's plan for redemptive history from the beginning of of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. In the Old Testament, though, it was veiled. Not everybody had 20-20 vision on what God was doing on the earth. He just had promises that were unfolded in layers. But the whole time it was there, in Christ, his plan became known. When you see Christ go to the cross to die for our sins, so that we can be forgiven, so that now a new humanity can be created, reconciled, Jew and Gentile made into one. Is the beauty of the gospel. Now, Paul says here for the deacon, that news, that good news of the gospel, it cannot be new news to a deacon. It can't be partially formed in a deacon. Instead, the truths of God's gospel are to be cemented and grounded in the core of their conviction. It's what drives them with boldness to proclaim the gospel unashamed and to serve Christ's church sacrificially. It's the reason why Stephen, one of those seven appointed in Acts 6, was known as being a man full of faith. Like he was so sold out for his faith. Serving as a deacon wasn't just some board member job, some side gig that he just kind of did. It wasn't a title for him. He was sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ, so much so that one chapter later, he would become one of the first martyrs of the church, giving his own life for the claims that he believed. That is a deacon. In addition to that, they're to be tested first. See this in verse 10. Let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. In other words, their qualification for being a deacon can't be something that's just theory. Can't just be aspirational. You can't just hand me a resume and go, here's who I am. No, we need to be able to see it. It needs to be proven and tested and witnessed to by those in the church. Um, Whenever somebody interviews here at Northway for a staff position, which is either usually uh, a, a deacon role, maybe it's an elder role, whatever it may be, or whether it's a lay deacon or elder, that's we're always asking, are you known? Where are you serving right now? 
We should have already seen it. Who are you discipling right now? Do you have a wake of followers that you've been leading and serving? You can't just come give a resume and say, I graduated from seminary, I have all the book smarts, so hire me, employ me, appoint me. That's not how it works. Like, they need to be vetted. We need to know that their character is what they say it is, and we need to know that their service and their reputation goes before them and that the body can testify to that. That's why whenever we present an elder, a deacon for the church, we give a 21-day response for everybody in the church to be able to look at and go, if there's any reason that you see that they're not qualified, let us know. And so they're to be tested first. Now, we'll come back to verse 11 in just a moment, but I want you to see the final qualification there in verse 12. They're essentially to be faithful in the home. That's what we're getting at here. When he says, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children, their own households well. Just as we talked about with elders, this doesn't mean that in order to be a deacon, you have to be married or you have to have kids. It's just what was the common example that existed in Ephesus at that time. And if you are married and if you do have children, then we need to see that you've been stewarding your home first before you try to bring that into the church in leadership. You can't export what you don't possess. And one of the greatest ways we can test somebody is by looking at their home life. What kind of husband or wife are you? What kind of parent are you with your children? Um, We are looking for faithfulness in the home. Now, that's seven qualifications right there, at least grouped together uh, for a deacon. Now, there is, I want you to notice, there's one thing that is missing from this list that was included with the elders. And there's one thing that is included in this list that was missing from the elders. And we need to deal with both of those. First of all, notice the one thing that's missing from this list that was in the elders. And that is the qualification of an ability to teach. In many ways, that is the distinguishing mark between an elder and a deacon. It's not to say that a deacon can't teach. Doesn't mean that they may not even be good at teaching. That's just not the, nat- the primary nature of their role. But for an elder, it is the primary function, the ministry of the word, being able to faithfully and accurately handle the word of God, to be able to protect the sheep from counterfeit ideologies that wanna seek in, seep into the church, to be able to guard sound doctrine. That's the role of an elder. The, the nourishment and the teaching of the church primarily in the assembled gathering, that is the role of an elder. For deacon, it's not essential that they have that. Uh, But when they do, if they do teach in areas, that's okay, but they're not to carry with that the full authoritative weight of apostolic truth for the church that has been entrusted to the elders, the overseers of the church. So that's one thing that was missing in this list that was present with elders. Notice now, secondly, in verse 11, something we didn't have mentioned in the elders list, but it is mentioned here, curiously. And with it comes much debate. We see this in verse 11. Their wives, likewise, deacons' wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Very similar qualifications. But the question is, what's going on here with wives? Is this verse talking about qualifications that need to exist in the wife of a male deacon? Or is this talking about female deacons? And there's debate here. And the reason there's a debate here is because of the word. Wives is not the word that's used in the Greek there. There's one word that's used there. It's the word gune, which also comes uh, from the, uh, the word gunikos, which we get the term gynecology. You're welcome. Take that one for free. Um, the study of a woman's reproductive system. We are dealing with a woman here. That's the word in Greek, woman. But here's the deal. Throughout the New Testament, the word gune gets translated in multiple ways. For instance, the word gune, a woman, can mean a virgin woman, one uh, who is a single maiden. It is also used in the New Testament of a woman who is betrothed. That is a woman who's engaged. It's also used of a woman who is married. She's a wife. And it can also be used of a widowed woman uh, whose husband has passed. 
The problem is we don't know how gune is used here in this text. The only way, in any text, you don't know how it's used. The only way you can tell how the author intended that particular woman to be used is in the context of the passage. And in this passage, it's debatable, just debatable. I'm gonna give you our conviction, my lean, our conviction in Northway here in just a moment. Um, But there are many people who disagree because they see it. And even those in different camps have to acknowledge grammatically it's very hard to understand how it's used here, the word woman. Now, if you're in the camp that holds to a deacon role should only be men, that indeed this verse is talking about wives of deacons and they need to fit some qualifications that help support the role of their husband. If that's where you land, you see that interpreted here that he's addressing wives um, and you also see it supported in the fact that the word gune used all throughout 1 Timothy, the majority of the times is used for wives in their context and other contexts. And many will also in this camp point to the fact of even in the seedbed of Acts chapter six, isn't it ironic that they chose seven men to care for the women? So it was men that were chosen. So others would go uh, that Gune here is clearly speaking to wives. But if you're in the camp that holds to a deacon role being open to women, then you see the flow of the Greek passage reading this way. Paul is addressing male deacons first. He then stops in verse 11, almost like a parenthetical statement, a parenthesis there to address the character of female deacons. And then he returns to finish his argument with male deacons in verse 12 about their homes. Now, while that may seem unnatural, the idea of Paul talking about one thing, switching gears for one verse and then switching back, this is actually the third time he's already done this in First uh, Timothy so far. Two times he's already done this before this. And while um, that's happening, there's also those in this camp who would su- support this view by observing a few other things. Number one, when Paul summarizes the whole work of deacons in verse 13, he says, for those who serve well, those who deacon well, the word those in the Greek uh, has a gender neutral article on it. In Greek, you take a word and you assign masculine or feminine to the article to tell who you're talking about. He uses gender neutral here on this one as to apply to both male and female. Um, In addition to that, Others would say, if this was meant to be about the wives of deacons, why on earth did Paul not mention the wives of elders? Certainly that would have had a lot of weight too towards the role of an elder, an overseer of the church, but he only addresses it here. And then others would have further support seen in places like Romans 16, uh, where the woman Phoebe is mentioned and she's described as a, a, a deacon, a, a, a diacono, a servant. And we don't know if that's the formal office she held or if she's just being a faithful servant in the church. We don't know, but others would see it that way. Either way, same qualifications are given here for these women as for the men, essentially. Now, all that to say, where does Northway land? We land in the camp, we hold the view that both men and women can serve as deacons in the church. Though we are careful, as we are with male deacons, deacons in general, to ensure that that role does not bleed into confusion with the role of an elder. And far too many churches have done that. I I got saved in a Baptist church where they had no elders. It was just deacons serving the senior pastor. And it made it really confusing when you're reading the scriptures going, why do I have two lists of qualifications here, but I only see one office that's being employed there. And that office, the deacons are functioning like elders. And, and we have throughout church history confused some of these roles, but we don't want that confusion. We want the clarity that the scriptures seem to be indicating here. Now, all that to say, here's how Paul lands the plane. Verse 13, for those who deacon well as deacons, it's literally what it says, those who serve well as deacons, they gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. At the end of the day, it is a heart for serving Christ by assisting the elders in in serving the practical needs of the church that should mark a deacon the most. Paul says that when a deacon serves well, they deacon well, they 
gain for themselves. Literally, the word gain means to purchase, to obtain. Y'all, we are not a works-based church when an understanding of salvation in the scripture. Our salvation is not works-based. You don't earn it. It's given freely, but through Jesus Christ, by faith alone, in Christ's work alone, that is given by his grace alone. We believe that, hold that to the grave. But there is one area that Paul says you can be works-based, and it's right here. When you serve well as a deacon, you buy for yourself, you earn for yourself two main things. Number one, you earn good standing. A good standing literally means a step up. A step up when it comes to your respect within the faith community that is the church in Jesus Christ. Talent comes and goes. Knowledge comes and goes. Um, Good looks come and go. But the ones who serve of themselves sacrificially for the good of others, that is who we should be holding in high regard in the church. We don't need to be celebrating position, platform, power, um, talent. We need to be holding up the servants, the ones who demonstrate godliness in their sacrificial servitude to the church. That is, when you serve well, you gain a step up in your respect in the body. Is that not true? Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 23. He who humbles himself will be exalted. He said in Matthew 20, he who's last should be first. There's an exaltation that comes in serving well. That's a good thing. Second thing you purchase for yourself when you serve well is great confidence. I don't think that's the best translation in the ESV that I'm seeing here. The literal phrase means bold speak. You buy for yourself bold speak. We would put it this way in our language today. It's the right to be heard. When someone serves faithfully and sacrificially for the good of others, it gives them a greater platform for their message to be trusted. Is that not true? Paul's saying this to a church that has been commandeered by false teachers who are fleecing the church for self-gain. You couldn't trust them. And he says, if you wanna be respected and heard within the church, and even in the world around you, especially with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then seek to serve others faithfully, sacrificially, serve them well for their good. And man, you will buy for yourselves the right to be heard when it comes to the message that your mouth is proclaiming. You're not writing checks that your life hasn't cashed. Now, how does all this play out at Northway when we step back from this text? There's not a whole lot written more on deacons than the text we've looked at today. So there's a lot of charity that does need to be given here when it comes to the functions of this role. But let me tell you, how does this play out in Northway? First of all, we dignify the two offices that we see in scripture. Uh, The office of elder and pastor, I mentioned last time, we use those terms interchangeably because the scriptures do. These are the qualified men who are focused on the spiritual oversight and the shepherding of Christ's church through the ministry of the word and in prayer. They are the shepherds of the church, nourishing the body through the word of God. And then there's the second office of deacon and minister. And we use those terms at Northway interchangeably. The word minister literally means the same thing, a servant, serving ministry. It's to carry out this function. Deacon, minister, these are qualified men and women who are focused on the practical needs of leadership and care and equipping and serving the church. And when these two offices function well, the church flourishes. The church gets nourished in the word and gets cared for and mobilized for healthy ministry. In Northway, we have both paid elders and lay elders, non-paid elders. We have both paid um, deacons and we have non-paid deacons, lay deacons. We're gonna talk more about how you get to even paying folks at the end of this book. But for now, we have both of those. And as I mentioned with elders, In the same way with deacons, not every qualified man or woman is going to serve as a deacon at Northway Church. But every deacon has got to be qualified in order to serve at Northway Church. The difference between a deacon and a volunteer is that a deacon carries the authoritative office and role within the church for mobilization in which they are deputized and deployed by the elders under the elders to serve specific needs and mobilize the saints for ministry. And whereas the role of an elder will always be permanent within the church, like that doesn't go away, 
The role of a deacon can come and go because it's usually context-based on the needs that are in the church. Some of them will stick around for a lot longer, but some, that need may get met and that, that particular role goes away. And so it's always evolving depending on the particular context. And, uh, and I assure you, uh, right now, we have about 15-ish deacons, uh, paid and non-paid at Northway. On staff, I'll list uh, what we got here. Cassie Bryant, she leads as our, uh, helps oversee and, 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 and administrate the organization of our next gen ministry and caring for our kids that are here. And she serves on our executive team. Josh Duncan uh, helps organi- organize and administrate in our music and lead out there. JC Cruz helps uh, serve in our elementary and organize and administrate over our elementary students. Christy Pope does the same thing with our preschool students. Um, Lauren Clawson does so with our Compass Kids. Uh, Damaris Castillo, uh, she helps organize organize and administrate with our local missions. Um, Amanda Seeley serves in that category with our care and counseling ministry here. Lori Hearn and Jonathan Menendez, they serve uh, as ministers over our GCs and help organizing our groups. Um, And then also in addition, Lindsay, uh, Britain does a master work here in our connections of assimilation of all those who come into the church and all the teams that exist under her. Um, on the lay side, the non-paid deacons we have, we got Ben Jones, who serves in our premarital ministry, helping meet the needs of our uh, newly engaged folks. We got um, Patty Reese and Kate Carol Pemberton serving with our senior adults. And then we've got one new deacon who's gonna get installed tonight, Haley Overton. Uh, who has stepped into a critical need serving with our new moms here at Northway as that ministry has swelled in the days um, here recently. At the end of the day, each deacon, and I promise you more needs will arise. There are more deacons that we need to raise up in the days ahead. At the end of the day, while each deacon carries a formal role within the church, they merely are exemplifying the character and the servant heartedness that should exist in every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ. And my charge, therefore, to all of us in this room, whether you serve as a deacon or not, is that all of us, as blood-bought, redeemed in Jesus Christ, should be committed, committed to walking out a godliness of abiding devotion in Jesus Christ, who are looking for tangible needs that we can meet in order to bless others in the church in such a way that the church can keep going unhindered in its mission of gospel proclamation and making disciples. And as we do so, we need to recognize as we serve in Christ's body, we are emulating the greatest deacon who has ever lived on planet earth. King Deacon Jesus Christ, who said of himself in his very purpose for why he came to the earth in Mark 10, 45, listen to this, I would translate literally, for even the son of man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon, came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And you know what? He went and he proved it. He went all the way to the cross for us where he shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, cleansed us of all unrighteousness, rose three days later so that we could be made new by putting our faith in his work, not our own. And now through his blood-bought salvation has sealed and secured us for all eternity in him until the day he returns to take us home. The greatest need that has ever been had in the history of the world was our need for reconciliation in Jesus Christ. And he came sacrificially and met it for us. And on the night that he was betrayed, he got down on his feet and he washed the dirtiest parts of his disciples' body, their feet, and admonished them that we would go do the same with one another. So in the spirit of that, let us all go deacon, even as some will be appointed to the official office of elder or deacon for the sake of the church and the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you that you have not left us in silence about how we can steward the various needs that exist within the body. 
Lord, we just confess there are still more needs, even here at Northway. I know many other areas that we can feel neglect in, and it's ever-changing with the, um, with the uh, complexities that continue to develop here as a church. And so, Lord, we just ask for your help. I pray for a day when, when it comes time to appointing future deacons, we would just have a giant pool of qualified men and women. Some may not aspire to it, and that's okay, but some will. And may we just have more than an abundance of choice to pick from when it comes to character, godliness, and servant-heartedness. Lord, for your sake and for the good of your church, would you help us to meet these needs, keep our elders on task to faithfully preach the word of God and mobilize our deacons to serve the various ministries of this church so that we can see the good news of Jesus Christ multiplied and the church grow even more in the days ahead here in Dallas to the ends of the earth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.